We are super excited to be hosting this event with our first curator, Philip Johnson, Chief Curator of Architecture and Design at the Museum of Modern Art, and with Anne Yachty, Associate Professor of Architecture at MIT. So today, Martino is going to speak to us about the current exhibition at MoMA, Toward a Concrete Utopia, Architecture of Yugoslavia, 1948 to 1980. This exhibition, his first major undertaking since arriving at the museum, was co-curated by Vladimir Kulich and is, is clearly necessary for a project of this scope to involve a team of researchers and writers who appear in this sumptuous publication, which you should all get. Um, so after Martino's presentation, Anna and I will talk relatively informally with Martino about this major work, and then with some luck, we will all have better and more penetrating questions for Martina You likely know our guests, but just a few biographical highlights to remind you. Before coming to MoMA, Martino was Swiss National Science Foundation professor at the Institute of Art History at the University of Zurich, and among, these are very abbreviated, Biographies. Among his other essays and books, he has recently published Montage of the Metropolis, Architecture, Modernity, and the Representation of Space, as well as Las Vegas in the Rearview Mirror, The City in Theory of Photography and Film. Anna, you probably all know, was part of the free member curatorial team for the U.S. Pavilion at the 2014 Architecture Biennial with the Project Office U.S. Among her books and publications, uh, we find the optimum imperative Czech architecture for the socialist lifestyle, 1938 to 1968. And she's the editor of Terms of Appropriation, Modern Architecture and Global Exchange with Amanda Reeser Lawrence. Um, and I suppose even more germane to today's topic, I learned, I don't know why I don't know this, because I have a friend, her parents were architects in Yugoslavia during the period this show deals with, so she has knowledge of the material as a historian and theorist, and, is also, and also through intimate personal experience, which is sort of hard to read. And so, if I defer to Anna throughout today's conversation, you will know why. Um, Toward a Concrete Utopia follows previous exhibitions devoted to the particular modernism of Yugoslavia. To name just a few, there was Modernity in Yugoslavia, the storefront for art and architecture in 2005, curated by Marko Lubic. Balkanology, New Architecture and the Urban Phenomena in Southeastern Europe at the Swiss Architecture Museum in 2008. Curated by Maria Julis. Maria Julis. <laughs> I'm going to destroy these names. And Vladimir Kulich. And Unfinished Modernizations Between Utopian Pragmatism, Architecture and Urban Planning in the Former Yugoslavia and the Successor States at a series of institutions in 2012 and 2013. Curated by Team, uh, including Vladimir and Maria. And so those exhibitions tell us something about the lead up to this exhibition in MoMA, but as Martino and Vladimir astutely observe in their introduction to the catalog, and I'm interpolating here, because of its legacy, because of its visibility within architecture and for a large public audience, and especially in light of MoMA's role in the former Yugoslavia as a participant in a westernizing cultural diplomacy, the show at MoMA carries a special responsibility, a responsibility they identify as the revision of history. And, and I'm sure Martina will tell us in more detail how they see this revision playing out through the exhibition. <coughs> but in anticipation of his comments, and because of my own background and interest in exhibitions, and because I recognize how complicated this is, what they're trying to do, I want to suggest just a few of the challenges faced by this project, challenges that are related to historical revision, but also to exhibition practice generally, and to exhibitions at MoMA more specifically, as I imagine. Um, so first, in turning to Yugoslavia between 1940 and 1980, the exhibition has to contend with what the curators call the parallel universe of the non-aligned movement of the post-war for which Tito's Yugoslavia was foundational and pivotal. So this is, just, this is not just an exhibition about another place or another time, but an exhibition, exhibition that confronts the curious alterity of the non-aligned movement, 
both within and outside the territorial, political, and discursive formation of the Cold War map. And that attempts to underscore, the exhibition attempts to underscore the possibility of other global networks and relations. So one challenge of the exhibition is how to keep this oscillation inside and outside this Cold War map, this Cold War logic, present within the themes and the organization of documents and materials of the exhibition. How to glimpse this possibility of alterity within these documents. One aspect of the show's historical revision is its return to or its recuperation of socialist architecture. And last night in conversation with Martino Rapkulhaus showed some images of his meeting with a group or a confederation of Yugoslavian architects and referenced the creative bureaucracy that permeated the era. So another challenge, as I see it, for the exhibition is how to use the documents, photos, models, films to not only illustrate the extraordinary formal inventiveness of Yugoslavian architecture, but also to reveal some of the other modes of work, labor, authorship, and creativity that they signal. At the same time, how to use those documents to show architecture as central to a socialist project of self-management and the reconception of reorganization of life through the new programs of the building cultural centers and anti-fascist monuments alike represent. At the same time as showing the effects of the collective project of Yugoslavian modernism, the show also has to expose the complex national fabrication that is Yugoslavia. The show has to show how this fabrication both holds the state together and keeps present the particularities of the country's constituent republics. Especially because, as we know, this national fiction of Yugoslavia seeds to emergent nationalist identities through the violent ruptures and conflicts of the 1990s. So we have to show this material then not only as buildings and plans, but as the expression of historical, social, and conflictual forces that are coursing through Yugoslavia and being held in tension over these years. And finally, maybe this is the most challenging, if those challenges weren't yet enough. How does this show help us think through the problems of creative bureaucracy within MoMA? How to make the work of the institution relate to the topic? Or how to work with an institution in a project like this that could represent a subversion to its own forms of display, authorship, and audience? To put this differently, what does the show change at MoMA? What revision is there to MoMA through this exhibition? Last night, um, after seeing Martino and talk, so this has been an intense encounter with Martino and this exhibition in the last few days, Anna and I walked the mile-long opera, which is spectacular, and you should all do it. And one of the refrains, for those of you who haven't seen this, which Anna accused of relativism, is a series of ambivalent declarations that goes like this. Money changes everything, money changes nothing. Evidence changes everything, evidence changes nothing. So to extend that course, we could say, a show at MoMA on socialist architecture changes everything. A show at MoMA on socialist architecture changes nothing. So how to answer that everything or nothing, or somewhere in between, will depend on not only the accomplishment and the ambitions of this particular exhibition, but also on how you read the capacity, agency, and impact of exhibitions and their institutions for our discipline and for our work here. So with that, I'd like to welcome you to you. Thank you for joining us on this Friday afternoon to spend some more time on the place long gone that, of course, as Mark indicated, I believe is still worth considering from a contemporary perspective. <coughs> After the point that Mark has made, I almost feel we should start immediately with the discussion <laughs> instead of me actually doing a formal presentation because he did raise obviously some very, very key um, issues related to this exhibition. Nevertheless, I think I'm going to try in 20 or 25 minutes to briefly, um, not so much give you a survey of the exhibition, um, as I think most of you have probably seen it by now, but more some general thoughts about the curatorial thinking behind why Yugoslavia, why now? And also perhaps um, a little bit an introduction into the making of how you actually organize a uh, project on this scale and particularly at the moment. So perhaps some 
my, 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 my brief remarks will maybe obliquely uh, provide beginnings of an answer to the very interesting and important questions that Mark just raised in his own remarks. Anyway, recently, and while I was still fully immersed with the preparations uh, for Toward a Concrete Utopia, which is currently on view, I had a chance to listen to a tape recording of a lecture delivered by one of my predecessors, the long-term director of the Department of Architecture and Design, Arthur Drex. This le lecture was delivered on the occasion of his controversial 1979 exhibition, Transformations in Modern Architecture. This is a little bit of a on label gazing, um, and um, hopefully um, I'll make myself clear what I think I'm doing this. What Drexler presented in his exhibition and what he talked about in his lecture was a stock taking of architectural production roughly from 1960 to 1979. Drexler had in earlier <coughs> instances perpetuated the heroic story of modernist architecture and its adaptation to it as the new lingua franca of the post war US. The 1979 exhibition presented the story of the decline, swan song, uh, to the modernist project. As it were, showing you an installation of, um, of, of, of this seminar exhibition. The show represented a large number of recent buildings through a large selection of photographs and exclusively photographs, the display of which transformed the contents into a kind of architectural white noise, indicative of Drexler's critical stance. Referencing the political events of the most recent period, so this we're talking about in the 1970s, Drexler drew a somber and pessimistic outlook, one that had left culture in general and architecture more specifically in a situation of disorientation and insecurity. What struck me in particular in Drexler's lecture was the fact that he invoked the ability to make people happy as a measure for what is good architecture. Happiness as a category of architecture. Architectural thinking has, of course, only recently been reintroduced into the discourse by Alain de Botton on the architecture of happiness. And so I found it remarkable that the concept was so central for Drexler's argument back in 1979. I'm quoting him. Among the things that architecture can do and the way we know that it makes us happier is that it gives us the feeling that we are living at the right time and in the right place. Well, the last 20 years has been a period in which more and more of us feel that we're living in the wrong time and probably in the wrong place. And further, still Drexler, we are at the moment struggling with the consequences of our previous beliefs and actions. But the struggle has not yet revealed any new beliefs or actions. Drexler's words resonate with me because they seem to speak to our current historical moment as much as they did to his lecture some 40 years ago. The wrong time and the wrong place. Quite apart from the political repercussions, his comments address a moment in which architecture was able to provide society with a sense of community and was intended for the common good. You may wonder by now why I'm telling you all this, and perhaps it's just a rather digressive answer to the question why a major exhibition on the architecture of Yugoslavia in the post period should happen now and at the moment. One answer I would want to give is that I believe it is necessary to remind the architectural pro profession, and perhaps more so the audiences, that architecture can and should be more than a luxury commodity or an academic investigation. Even though socialism came with its own set of problems, and as we know, was ultimately then doomed to fail, I believe that studying the architectural production of socialist Yugoslavia in the wider context in which it was produced is worthwhile to remind us of the role architecture can take in constructing a better society based on a shared vision. And indeed, it is my prediction that ultimately architecture as a discipline can only thrive in a climate where there is a shared understanding about its capacity to contribute to, to such a shared vision and how we should live together. Hence the title of the exhibition, The Concrete Utopia, which is of course a reference to the writings of the Hansen and the Prince of 
It is this visionary potential inherent to and vital for architecture that we seek to explore in our current exhibition. So much for a first political answer to why this exhibition now and, uh, and, and why it now. There is also a second answer to this question and it is an answer that I would like to give um, not so much as a citizen of the world today but as a, a historian. And once again I would use Drex's lecture to make my point. Talking about the news media on the other one, <coughs> the museums on the other, Drex discusses the task of each respective institution. <coughs> Whereas the task of the news media is to, quote, validate news. It's also an interesting reminder how, uh, how short it could be about this guy. The task of museums is to validate, and quotes, what he says, quote, what is good. And he says, quote Drexler, sometimes that entails a reappraisal of what may have been ignored or ne neglected or overlooked or dismissed. And of course, the word a concrete utopia is intended to be precise in such a degree case. We all know of the outsized power Roma has had historically in shaping the canon of modern architecture, but we are only now starting to understand what has all been left out of this canonical narrative. The task of a global architectural history, in my opinion, is not just to add new places and names to such a history, but to allow for an alternative narrative that look in particular at how modern architecture was shaped through international exchanges, not merely between the West and elsewhere, but also in dialogue between places that have been almost systematically overlooked, in particular between the East and what we now call the global South. By looking at Yugoslavia and its global economic, political and architectural networks, I believe it is possible to sketch an alternative history to globalization, one that is substantially earlier than our current neoliberal age, and one that goes beyond and in fact counter to the spread of a Western hegemonic worldview across the world. Balkans regions has long been seen from a Western point of view as only peripherally associated with the project of modernity. Map of the territory. <coughs> and the historical map of the territory indicating sort of this um, land of in-betweenness where um, the superpowers of the previous centuries, here is the map of the 18th century, intersected on the territory was, what, was become, what was to become <coughs> Yugoslavia. Historian Maria Todorova has shown how the former Yugoslavia has been construed in Western art, literature and culture as Europe's internal other, uh, authority was mentioned previously. And following this logic, the region has been characterized according to three basic conditions, namely those of territoriality with regard to an imagined center, which is, of course, imagined to be Western Europe. Under development, the second uh, condition, and the third uh, condition, colonization by forces from both East and West. These generalizations apply to architectural history as well, where canonical accounts of architectural modernism tend to completely ignore any significant contribution that may have originated from this region. In considering the Yugoslav architects' production and networks of exchange between 1948 and 1980, a very different picture of the region seems to emerge. Rather than a secondary backwater of the modern world, Socialist Yugoslavia can, as our exhibition argues, instead be seen as a laboratory of globalization that undermined Cold War era economies. Our exhibition argues that Yugoslav architecture was at the crossroads of an exchange of architectural knowledge and ideas across ideological divisions, political borders, and cultural gaps, producing a cosmopolitan and hybrid body of work that demands retroactive inclusion into the history of architectural modernity if that narrative is to expand beyond 20th century backgrounds. <coughs> Only three years after its founding in 1945, Socialist Yugoslavia in 1948 broke with the Stalinist Soviet Union and was subsequently forced to forge new international alliances. Yugoslavia has rapidly opened itself to the West, both politically and culturally, culturally, 
The break with Stalin uh, had left the fledgling socialist Yugoslavia with uncertain prospects and without any ideological or fi financial support to construct its vision of a socialist society. However, this crisis also paved the way for a disproportionately large role that a small country was to assume in the Cold War. Under President Truman and Eisenhower, the United States sought to re replace the Soviet influence in Southern Yugoslavia wedge that could be driven into the communist bloc, a spirit of Western influence that would potentially destabilize the USSR's firm grip on Eastern Europe. Throughout the 1950s, the US generously, generously supported the country with economic and military means, and the Museum of Modern Art took a key role in applying soft power politics by spreading the gospel of Western art and architecture in Yugoslavia. For example, a traveling exhibition, Modern Art in the United States, presented a selection of works from Mons permanent collection to audiences in various European cities, including Belgrade in the summer of 1956. And you see here uh, people lining up uh, to see uh, one of the most organized shows. The exhibition included an architecture section featuring 16 buildings which were shown at the local Fresco Museum, among them the recently completed Lieber House, uh, which is here uh, represented in that large scale, scale photographic row and um, adored <coughs> by two um, women who are visiting this show. The exhibition marked the end of the Corbusier fever that had raged Yugoslavia a few years earlier, only to be replaced by a preference for American post-war modernism and its attributes of transparency, slab buildings, and curtain walls. The exhibition built in USA post-war architecture and also traveled to, to, to um, Yugoslavia in 1958, and there's also a catalog that was published in uh, Soviet Croatian on this exhibition. So, so much for the presence of soft power supplied and by the international program of the Museum of Modern However, Tito succeeded in sustaining Yugoslavia's independence from NATO and commitment to a socialist system. According to its very own terms and the decentralized ideology of self-management, which is fundamentally different, from the top-down um, political apparatus in so many other um, communist countries, and in particular the East, Eastern Bloc, uh, the self-managed system that is applied in the Yugoslavia could be seen more as a um, um, bottom-up uh, system where, where um, power was powers much more <coughs> distributed uh, perif peripherally and decentrally. I'm actually very curious to learn more from Anna's perspective and how um, architects actually would, would operate in, in such, in such um, in, in a system. Our exhibition argues that the system of self-management had consequences for the architectural profession. Most importantly, it favored a strong system of competitions for public commissions, and of course almost all commissions were public to some uh, degree which in turn produced a great deal of visionary painting and design, some of which was eventually uh, executed in real buildings and we included in the show. Of course, I've just shown two random examples of perhaps particularly interesting work. Um, um, we have a, a, a high-rise tower in Slovenia and a drawing of a um, stadium by Boris Nagash for the city of Spirit, which was also executed. Looking for new geopolitical alliances in 1956, Tito, together with the leaders of India, Nero, and Egypt, Nasser signed the Declaration of Brioni, which is generally seen as the founding document of the non aligned movement, an alliance that sought to establish a middle ground between the two dominant opposing blocs of the Cold War. The movement was formalized in the first conference of the non aligned countries in Belgrade in 1961. A loose association of nations, here um, a map of the attendees of the 1961 uh, regional conference. <clears throat> Many of these countries were newly independent nations in post-colonial Africa and elsewhere in the global south. <clears throat> Provided Yugoslavia a powerful platform for securing, for securing economic independence for both East and West. 
It also opened up a multitude of opportunities for exporting its modernist architecture and engineering expertise overseas. I'm showing you here a photograph of Milica Stevich, who was the head of the architecture division of the Belgrade-based uh, firm Energo Project. And Echo Project was particularly successful in this regard. From the 1960s onward, the company built a large number of large-scale infrastructure and architectural projects all across Africa. The most prominent example, of course, is the Lagos Trade Fair complex, which is based on ethnographic research and traditional settlement of technologies in Nigeria. For those of you who were present at the lecture last night uh, that Rem uh, Kulas delivered, of course, then later um, came into the focus of his own research interest. So, here are some of the original plan drawings that were shown in the show of that <coughs> tri trade fair uh, compound. And here are some of the research, ethnographic research on se traditional settlement stru um, structures in, in um, <coughs> Nigeria, in particular here, of course, that was then translated into the uh, plan of the trade fair. So these are just a few very brief remarks on the aspect of worldliness uh, of the global networks of Yugoslav architecture culture featured, which is the topic of one of the four main sections of the show. And I'm listing you here in a, in a brief survey um, the, the different sections of the show. Where we start with a general introduction into the theme of modernization, with the underlying question, how was um, the and formerly rural and relatively um, underdeveloped uh, pre-war Yugoslavia transformed in a high urbanized and highly industrialized society within only a few years after World War II. Um, we then go to the global network, which was the topic of what I was trying to, to um, sketch out very briefly here. It includes also, of course, the reconstruction of Skopje, <coughs> tourism, art infrastructure, and so on and so forth. Then the third section is uh, entitled Everyday Life, and it basically asks the question, so how is the heroic project of modernization, um, this utopian vision of transforming society according to the idea or image of a socialist society, that actually, how does it arrive in the everyday life of citizens? So there's a strong focus on questions of housing, also of uh, design, <coughs> and, and design uh, objects, uh, for the household, and so on and so forth, um, and um, also some, some questions of architectural education are addressed there. And the fourth, um, the fourth and final sec section deals with the questions, the question of how is this project of an overarching modernization then moderated with the need for self-expression of uh, different uh, ethnic cultural factions in a multi-ethnic multicultural society. Of course, it was one of the defining features of the Yugoslav project. I would like to wrap up this lecture with a few general comments on how I see the role of architecture curator in a large museum such as the Museum of Modern Art, perhaps also referencing what Mark was developing uh, as his fourth point. This task is obviously quite different from that of a colleague in an architecture museum or an architecture gallery in an educational institution such as Columbia University. The key difference is probably that of the audience. While an architecture museum first and foremost addresses the architectural community, an art museum has a much larger, more general audience. This is certainly true for MoMA with our roughly 3 million visitors annually many of whom come to the museum for the very first time as tourists, and many of whom will not have any particular interest or even prior knowledge of modern architecture, or actually architecture quite generally. So in an ideal world, I think an architectural exhibition in such an institutional setting will always try to be speaking on two different levels simultaneously. On the one hand, it will address the architectural profession and the design uh, audience, and it will try to make a new contribution to architectural knowledge through the presentation of new research. On the other hand, though, it will also try to capture the interest of a general audience and raise their awareness for architecture as an art and a discipline. 
In other words, a successful architecture exhibition needs to be, in my opinion, double-coded in that it speaks two different languages and, at, at once. And I think this um, sort of, if you want to call it populist uh, secondary <coughs> language that I think is important to have is not uh, it's not something that is just uh, populism for populism's sake, but I think it's actually a great opportunity and responsibility for a curator in such an institution to, yeah, to, to address an audience that has no prior interest in architecture and hopefully sensitize these kinds of audiences for what we think is important <coughs> No what. So how is this achieved? A few installation shots that I uh, I'm going to show you now, uh, perhaps give an indication of how we try to resolve this dilemma. Needless to say, a large chunk of objects in the view are original drawings, as well as some original models that we were able to collect from an, a large number of sources. I'm just showing you here two more or less random examples. And of course, as an architectural historian, I fundamentally believe in the significance of the um, original um, drawing and the original model and the aura, uh, the aura that such, a, that such a, 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 an object can unfold. So here the responsibility is obviously to, um, to um, elevate these drawings from an archival resource, resource into something that can be viewed and studied in an ideal uh, musical setting. Our show relies on some 50 lenders some of which are institutional, many of which, uh, though, private persons, which in itself was a major logistical operation. We have two more installation views, and one of the book done with Dunwich in the monographic space, and one of the Julian Neithart monographic space, which give you a further indicate, indication of the enormous breadth and diversity of the um, original material that we assembled. Architects and aficionados of architectural drawings will not be disappointed by our show, I don't think. In addition, and as a counterweight, we also made sure to bring a variety of different mediums into the mix in order to cater to a broader audience. One of these mediums are the large-scale photographic blow-ups with contemporary architectural photographs by volunteer Yek that are uh, arranged strategically throughout uh, the exhibition, and we use this very large sort of blow-up technique in order to um, sort of um, work as, as guideposts, but of course also to attract the attention of audiences who may be scared by uh, uh, first by looking at an architectural plan and the really drawing because they think it's too technical, they don't understand what is being shown and so on and so forth. I had known about his work from the time in Switzerland, and so we commissioned him to produce these images exclusively for the purposes of the exhibition. We feel they not only express the architectural and structural qualities of the buildings on display in an extraordinary way, they also add a sense of texture and atmosphere, an almost visceral dimension to the show that we felt would be a good way to convey some of the meaning that we wanted to bring across. We selected some 25 minutes from several hundred, from a body of several hundred, and these images are, as I already mentioned, situated strategically across the galleries and serve us as a kind of guidepost. Another meeting we were foregrounding is film and video. We collaborated with the Serbian-born filmmaker Mila Turanic to produce three short video pieces for the show. All these works are based on original footage from the period and serve as an invitation to visually dive into that post-war period. The most striking of these three productions is probably the introductory, introductory triptych, of which I'm showing you here some uh, stills, right at the very beginning of the exhibition. This is a four-minute short loop um, supported by an evocative soundtrack. The video tells the heroic story of the rapid modernization and urbanization of Yugoslavia within a very short period after World War II. And there's some really fun um, sort of uh, found footage pieces such as uh, this parading of architectural um, models through the streets of Belgrade. And then, of course, this massive uh, construction effort that included youth brigades uh, and so on and so forth. And in general, this very sort of 
forward-looking, um, uh, optimistic outlook to a uh, common shared future. Um, there's another uh, uh, 12 um, video installation. Oh, sorry, in the in the design and the everyday life section that you see here, which is a sort of ironization of the, um, the housing projects that I'm showing, because it's, it's also found footage work, but from TV and, and feature film productions that look in a, in a, in a <coughs> humoristic way at the problems um, of moving into these newly um, provided apartments and you know, problems such as spaces are too small, bad construction, there is corruption in the construction side, people don't get along in these other spaces and so on and so forth. So we also felt it was important to build in this uh, self-referential, um, critical knowledge that was already uh, present in Yugoslav popular culture at the period, uh, mainly through uh, film and TV productions. Milos' uh, films are complemented by a number of newly commissioned drone videos of what we think particularly successful examples of urbanist projects in Yugoslavia, such as the reconstruction of the city, city of Zadar after World War II when it was destroyed in a bomb attack, or the new city uh, of Split 3, uh, which is built for 50,000 people within only 10 years next to the existing city of Split. And here are again some uh, stills uh, from these drone videos that highlight not only the massive architectural assertion of this, of this project, but also the intricacy of, of the details on the street level as well as in the architectural formulation, which we think is extraordinary. The third addition to the mix are the new models that we produce in collaboration with students from the Cooper Union. We knew from the beginning that it would be very difficult to find original models for some of the key uh, works uh, that we wanted to highlight in our exhibition. And so um, what do you do uh, when you have that? You turn it into a pedagogical project, right? <laughs> so um, one of my collaborators, Matthew Wartnick and I, uh, taught a course at Cooper Union in the spring of 2017, which introduced the students to Yugoslav architecture. And um, we asked each of the students to pick their favorite project from, of course, our list. And uh, the four groups who would then collaborate over the semester to work on these models. The task was rather challenging because in many instances we were lacking even basic plans. And of course, there was also uh, no indication of what, what, what size, uh, what format should we choose, what materials, level of detail, and so on and so forth. So that uh, was um, uh, basically the major challenge of this, of this project. Um, uh, the class eventually expanded into a three-semester endeavor, and I, I can't stress how extremely grateful. We continue to be to the group reunion for their occupation enthusiastic support of this project. And the result, I believe, is spectacular. Um, these models are really outstanding and, and, and an excellent contribution to, to, to our, the show. Um, they have extraordinary technical quality and they really add a significant dimension to the exhibition, I think, that helps better understand uh, the extraordinary quality of some of the buildings represented. And here are some um, making of photographs um, at the group reunion. Um, yes. So I've already mentioned the term research in passing, and I've just elaborated a little on our col uh, collaboration with the group reunion. Some of you will know, and Mark mentioned that, of course, I have an academic background, and I, and I was teaching uh, at university before I came to Roma three and a half years ago. But because of this background, perhaps, it was very important for me to be able to continue working as a scholar in a museum and to use exhibitions as drivers for large-scale research projects. And indeed, my team and I worked on this exhibition for some three years, basically pretty much after I started at Roma. And in this sense, the project is, is comparable to writing a book in an academic setting, at least in terms of, um, of the duration of the project. Unlike in academia, however, where research is often understood to be a solitary endeavor in, in archives, libraries, and at the desk, research in the museum is very much a collaborative effort 
came perhaps to a lab situation here with scientists. Moreover, I also speak to uh, museum work as a sort of research in public. What we do at museums is meant to be of great public interest and visibility, which is both intimidating and empowering. It endows our work with a lot of responsibility, but it's also very gratifying to see the outcome eventually on such public display. And so how do you undertake such a gargantuan operation? I've already mentioned the aspect of co uh, collaboration. So another uh, really significant aspect of the exhibition was that we convened the curatorial advisory board with scholars, young scholars, uh, based in the respective uh, countries. Uh, of the former Yugoslavia that were really seminal uh, to help us uh, not only gathering material and establishing com contacts to all the different archives, resources, architectural offices, individuals and so on from whom we would then lend materials, but they were also eminently important for us to, to shape the narrative and as a sort of critical sounding board of our endeavor. I'm showing you here um, just a photograph from um, one of the two workshops that we organized in the region, um, relatively early in the project. This is uh, our first workshop that we organized in Skopje, uh, where of course we also took the opportunity to see and go, go see some of the um, extra, extraordinary buildings in that city. But of course then we also sat down and had a seminar um, where we discussed um, what the scope and uh, themes of the show might be. Because we also had a series of scholarly conferences and lectures at Roma and elsewhere. This is my co curator, Vladimir Kulic, lecturing in the CMAP program at Roma. CMAP is a program of research that focuses on non Western geographies, and there's a group focusing on Eastern Europe, and so that was um, also an ideal um, sort of resource for us to use to explore research and help us get a better understanding of how we would want to frame the exhibition. Then of course research in space. Uh, gathering the material and devising interesting questions is one thing, but how do you actually uh, convey um, um, these questions or problems in space in a model uh, with, with our chips? Very significant. The work was for many, many months, as many iterations of how space should be organized, and so on and so forth. And perhaps, unlike what Marx seemed to hint at in his introduction, I believe that there's a fundamental and significant and important difference to be made between a book on the one hand and, and the, the, the um, sort of um, the information that is convey the text as opposed to the, the medium of the exhibition which I think has its very own uh, fundamental principles of organization that are significantly different from those of the book. And so for this reason, uh, so this is the work on the model here, and for this reason um, it's also difficult for me, uh, equally important for me to stress that um, our project not only exists in a relatively temporary exhibition that's up for six months and then it's gone, of course we have an exhibition or installation shots, but there's also a book. And for me the book is not, or the exhibition catalog is not just um, a representation of the exhibition, but in my opinion it has to be an important contribution to state-of-the-art research on the topic at this specific moment. And so we spend a lot of time and effort in putting together this book, which includes a great number of, obviously, as a photographic um, um, portfolio at the beginning, but then a great number of essays, uh, relatively long three essays, and then a whole series of short essays that look at the very specific aspects that we found uh, more important to address and that make uh, Yugoslav architecture a unique and different and important uh, to discuss uh, as we believe in the, from a contemporary perspective. And also, um, and again, I think the book allows to dive into um, issues such as the sociology of the architectural profession or um, the um, Perhaps the question of uh, gender relationships in, 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 in Yugoslav architecture that are very difficult to convey in an exhibition and for which I think the 
essay or the book is much better sorted. So once again, speaking on two levels, is uh, perhaps in two different countries, I think, fundamentally important for how I think curation should work. This is a uh, two delicious and I, you know, I want to ask questions about the deflectivity of the frames that you use for the drawing. You know, I want this level of detail about the exhibition from its conception to its context, to how that's manifest in every form of spatial and perceptual interaction. I mean, in a way, I've been already upstaged by those questions that you posed at the beginning, because they are the questions I'm posing, or maybe some leveling of the show in the various reviews of it. Uh, so, but, so maybe I'll zoom out. So, uh, recently, in 2017, a youngish uh, Serbian writer uh, published a book, his name is Marko Vidojko, he published a book uh, called E Bašvom which says, thanks a lot. Now, I don't expect you to have read it, obviously, it's still <coughs> not translated, it's in Serbian. I'll show you the cover just so you have a sense of... Kind of. So it's a cover with the uh, the emblem of the country once upon a time, Yugoslavia, with some partisans coming out of it. And so in the story, this novel, which is a kind of a satirical sci-fi, um, which he himself describes as an engaged uh, novel, politically engaged novel, he uh, the key event that basically allows the narratives to unfold is that uh, somehow in 1989. A plane crashed with the entire Central Committee that was in, in actual history headed to decide the, the history of the country or the direction of the country and the, the whole Central Committee was basically erased in that event and what continued is Yugoslavia, Yugoslavia continued it in, in, the, in the moment that the novel is written it is a superpower, um, it basically has uh, cell phones that compete with Apple, it has just of a thousand and ones, like super Yugo. Uh, it has magnetic, uh, magnetic, magnetically powered trains between Skopje and Ljubljana, uh, and certain elements of authoritarianism, little bits of nationalism, and the kind of uh, socialist salutations that you would uh, experience in that moment. But through that country, through that reality that I mentioned, there's another one that seeps through at moments in the novel. And that uh, reality is the contemporary reality uh, that is uh, expressing a kind of poverty, hacked phones, more nationalism, reality TV, maybe buildings like the Valentine, uh, yes, uh, uh, photographs, I'd say. And so uh, for me, for a few minutes, so I'll speak now in one of the, with one of the hats that I wear. I wear many hats with respect to this show. Maybe the only one that I don't wear as a kind of possible audience is the general MoMA uh, audience that mildly is interested in brutalism, right? That's everything else I am, a child of architects, uh, someone who was forced to be socialist youth or became socialist youth regardless of what happened else in, in the kind of history of the family. Right? Uh, also a historian and, uh, and a supporter of the effort in the second book by architects. But so, what for me, for me, it's entering into the show and hearing the music of uh, a kind of a revolutionary anthem in the MoMA courtyard, which was uh, that specifically a song uh, called Yugoslavia, the, the fight uh, produced to Yugoslavia. Um, it was like being in this novel in that novel, the first version of the novel, I mean the first reality of the novel, Yugoslavia continued, here we are at MoMA, celebrating its product, um, with mild elements of, of, of the autocracy, nationalism, that you know, don't quite make it through, but I was, so, uh, it, and that song, so for someone from that moment in time, from Yugoslavia, a song like that would immediately uh, you know, make you sing it in your head because you have sung it many times, and so there's a certain amount of ambivalence that that produces uh, entering that show. But I think um, so. I'll just continue speaking in that mode. So for me, 
one of the interesting ways to think about the show is the for that audience. I do think the show is, uh, as I think you want it to be, an engaged, politically engaged show, at least on two accounts. So a piece of political engagement on both curatorial and historical terms, and both in this context and in the context that it represents. Right? In this context, because it is challenging an audience to think uh, alterity, to think a world that they don't understand and know. In that context, uh, in, the, in the Yugo context, uh, it is basically saying these products are valuable. Uh, think about them in a different way before you are uh, uh, painting over them with a kind of developer uh, economy, which is happening. Right? It's also, I think, important in that context as a as a as an elevation of a of a of a kind of architect that 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 period produced for the context. But anyway, so for someone who comes from that context, from the Yugo context in the show, it is an amazing piece. It certainly produces uh, forms of nostalgia, and I think there are forms of, couple of, two times, two types of nostalgia that at least Fetona Boyan, Boyan gives us. One is a kind of reflexive one, and, it, and the other is uh, a more serious, uh, simplistic one, one that sort of just uh, wishes the world could be as it once was, even though obviously it never was. Or we cannot uh, we cannot situate or talk about it in those terms, right? It's not like that was like a great world uh, in every aspect of it, but we can be nostalgic for it. And there's a version of nostalgia that I think is very useful for the audience from, the, from that uh, region, which would be that reflexive kind, the kind that maybe allows for a conversation to begin happening again in that context. But what, what is important about that is that as a, one of these uh, sort of audiences, when I arrive to the show, I bring the difficulties and the, the problems and uh, a kind of understanding of the way some of this work happened. Uh, to my love of the kiosk and love of the East Square telephone and uh, recognition of the buildings that uh, were part of the youth. But I worry about that sort of dimension not being, I sort of wish the show was more, was able to hold that contradiction a little more clearly. And I think, um, I think an exhibition ought to be able to do that just like a book differently. But I think this is not something we have to necessarily relegate to the historical text. We can challenge the show to do it. So when I think about the Valentin Gek uh, photographs, I actually try to give them that um, role uh, in the show, though I think they don't explain uh, the difficulty or the kind of the other reality that is here behind the work. But they certainly produce it through a kind of mood uh, that they bring into the show. I have many other things, but. Did you do, Martina, why don't you tell us? Uh, you know, um, obviously, um, thank you for these um, reflections. And I actually, you know, precisely. Um, I actually think, first of all, I think um, it's not necessarily um, our role as curators to prescribe a certain reading, but it should be, and I know mean, you weren't saying that, I'm just, uh, just saying that as a, as a, I think what an exhibition should try to do is offer, uh, sort of, um, yeah, give an offering that, that makes the, the, the um, members of the audience, wherever they are, and whatever background they have, and think about that proposition. And so, you could walk through this exhibition and I think, um, come out and, and think, oh, this is actually a kind of a glorification of sort of Titoist, um, whatever, um, politics, and it's how, for, for whatever strange reasons, um, allowed for a uh, surprising amount of creativity and you know, that, but also that much of that creative potential was activated and actually made into real existing buildings. I think that's also actually extraordinary. Um, but 
Um, I do think that it was very important for us to, of course, have this uh, corrective uh, built into the show as well. And how did we do that? Precisely through the insertion of artworks. Yasmina yes, Tibet's um, piece, for example, with um, the, um, the Richter Pavilion, where you sort of see the metaphorization of um, the instrumentalization of modern architecture on this part of the state power in order to convey a sort of progressivist um, um, image of that state in, in the world. Through the young photographs, um, of course, on the one hand, they are, um, you could say, say they, 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 they speak a little to this um, obsession with brutalism in the current period. At the same time, we felt they were um, really good in conveying and not explaining, but conveying exactly um, an atmosphere of the um, aftermath that we didn't want to explicitly contextualize. And then there's of course also, for example, um, the last uh, video piece by an um, Hungarian filmmaker, which is from a uh, from, uh, from film, and it's, I've not seen it, it's a short clip of the film of where three men visit the site of the Yosemite's uh, memorial, which is the site of a concentration camp in, in, in Croatia, where um, fascist um, occupiers killed uh, hundreds of thousands of people. And so these men visit, um, revisit that um, monument, and basically in the next ten, the last 10 years or so, and can talk about um, sort of the oblivion that um, is, that it's history faces that people um, are forgetting the fact that this was a concentration camp that people were killed here. And of course, and they're talking as you know, they're reflecting nostalgically in a way um, about this problem of history, um, which is a problem of the <coughs> losing weaknesses of World War II, but at the same time. We felt that the film was also making a very sort of, you know, um, was also referencing, of course, the civil war that led to the breakup of Yugoslavia. And so we felt also, you know, we didn't want to be in your face with that other history. We wanted it to be something that's carried on um, and I think that is very present if you if you want to have the awareness for it, but you don't necessarily need to to do to, to, to get an explanation on that. So I think an exhibition is more than just conveying information and uh, intellectually and there are many other um, opportunities to do it um, by the creation of atmosphere, by illusions and, and so on and so forth. And I think that is that I should have strongly agree with that. The, um, for anybody who see, saw the show and sees the images, the photographs are unforgettable and dominating. And it's so interesting to hear you talk about them because of your invocation of Brexler and transformations and the role of the photographs in that show. And the idea of insecurity that yeah. percolates through Drexler's conversation. And, and so thinking about how you use or try to mobilize those images, which at one level are Brand and heroic and glorifying, but also deeply unsettling and, and images of a form of insecurity. And, and so that seems like an incredibly interesting curatorial gambit to think of how those images can work against the easy complacency of some of the other documents. How can those images unsettle that narrative? And, I, and I, how you how you've tried to do that within the show is a, is a fascinating proposition. So I, I would wonder then how, how else could one extend that curatorial strategy of insecurity through the exhibition? And I'm not sure if that's something you were thinking through is, or... But I want to go, I mean, this is where I'm sort of going. So um, I think there's a, a bit of a paradox between the kind of curatorial voice that we do hear in the text and these other decisions. Right, there is a way in, in which text? In, in the Yugoslavia, the beginning text, in almost or every text, the, the, the walls all and the curatorial yeah. works that are on the walls in the exhibition are really supporting a very particular kind of history. Right? 
So you may tell us that we should walk through this and uh, collect our own understanding, but it is framed by the territorial voice. And for me, this is where uh, I am questioning a little bit because I think um, the kind of reading of the country and uh, of its history and the kinds of lessons that I think you're asking us to learn from it. So there's a kind of proposal in the opening text of the exhibition that says, this is valuable for us right now. And I, and I agree, right? As a, as a kind of body of historical knowledge, I think it's valuable. Uh, but then I think uh, the depth of that, uh, what we walk away with, is also about, right? Precisely so that we don't fall into a kind of nostalgia, which I think Rang was really resisting yesterday uh, in the lecture. He didn't want to uphold the show for, as a model. Right? But they are in the text themselves, I think, things are offered as a model. Whereas then at moments, we have maybe the, I mean, I'm, I'm a little bit about the young photographs more generally because I think they are a very personal uh, and specific and stylized rendition of that architecture. But I like that if they are capable of, or uh, if they're at least a symbol of your curatorial desire to imbue the show with certain amount of uncertainty and security. Yeah. And um, so, <laughs> that, was, that was indeed why we chose you know, these photographs. But I want to think about your text. Well, yeah. yes, uh, obviously um, we do have a narrative, and then um, we, we are, you know, um, certainly foregrounding and um, something. And I, you know, I think that's that is necessary. You know, it's. Um, if we were just um, wanting to show an individual project that we liked for some reason, I think that's that's not enough for, for a show. We had a, a project. So then I think there are certain things that are promised in that uh, opening to talk about uh, the lessons from that context, right? That engaged architect who's working on behalf of the collective who uh, is engaged in the kind of allegorical materialization of that state uh, and self-management in objects, right? So there are some of the lessons there we're supposed to really take away, right? Um, well, but, for example, you know, you could uh, look at the fact that there's basically exclusively public buildings in the exhibition. I mean, if you were attentive to that fact, you could perhaps wonder what is that mean? What is the but, background of the... Um, um, Sort of the, the system that allows for this or that provokes the RB completely, uh, you know, oblivious of certain other uh, levels of. Well, let me finish. So you said here it wouldn't be enough to show several buildings uh, yeah. to do this job. Yeah. And, I, and I wonder at what point do you decide that the national framework is the right framework to address these questions? As opposed to a few buildings that have their own deep histories of labor, of interconnections, of site, of off self management, off the state. But why? I'm not quite sure I understand what you mean by national. Yugoslavia is uh, no longer a nation, but that's a national. It's a kind of a national exhibition. It's like built in U.S., built in Japan, built in Yugoslavia to some extent. Ah, I disagree. I think we chose Yugoslavia, and Yugoslavia is uh, significantly different from a national exhibition in that in, its, in itself it was um, divided into these uh, relatively, relatively autonomous uh, constituent republics, and what we were interested in exploring there was not so much the construction of a national um, whatever heroic story but rather investigating how this overarching project of a shared modernity was moderated and reflected on and countered to some degree by the need to give specific um, um, identities to the different ethnicities and 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 you know um, religions and so on that that this this body uh, constituted. So the fourth section of the show is you know titled identities and again obviously we're using historical material. But I think the underlying question behind.
time is much more fundamental than just you know, some <coughs> random. Uh, it's really about how do you <coughs> moderate and how do you express a multi ethnic society uh, and how do you help it express um, its, its internal diversity through architecture. And I think that is actually is relevant for, very relevant for our contemporary moment. Thank you both. Um, do any of you have the <coughs> penetrating questions that I promised you might have? Well, I have a comment. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't fully understand the conversation. Um, I mean, what's at stake? Because uh, I think one of the show also in the present context, worldwide context. I think one should look at the show in the context of this present historical reality, where the swing to the right worldwide is enormous. And, uh, and, the, uh, and the, the, the fact that uh, Yugoslavia did stand for a kind of third way, a whole long line thing, is, is pretty astonishing. The fact that it survived after the great discovery. Okay, the U.S. intervened, but so the, but the third way gave possibility for some kind of third way, and uh, we're long from that today. You know. And uh, so I think that's the context for the show. And the other thing is that um, while on the one hand it shows from a respect free and zada as they are today with these uh, drone photographs, etc., which are pretty remarkable things to look at from the point of view of the chaos which we are, we are proliferating all over the world and that incapacity to make anything now of any, of any kind of collective consequence. And, uh, and then, you know, the show ends with these memorials and with this absolutely mind-blowing map of the number of war memorials in Yugoslavia and the, and the narrative tells you that the all of have been destroyed by certain factions and so on and so forth. So if you really do look at this exhibition and go to the end with the famous film which uh, Martin just referred to, you know, and all these, and also the ruined buildings that the photographer takes, ruined monuments which you don't really understand because they were partly also buildings. Um, you know, I, I don't think, you know, there's nothing quite artistic about the entire exhibition. I don't see it uh, as a kind of flattening out of the rivalries which di divided the Balkans before and divided the Balkans uh, again, you know. And uh, so I think that that speaks to a really, I think it's an astonishing experience because I think there are many, many levels at which it operates. You know. Above all for me, because I happen to be a big admirer of Ravnica, showing Ravnica, you know, and also what Ravnica could teach for 30 years. Uh, unknown figure, basically, right? And many other unknown figures. So I think that one of you, um, I understand, you know, maybe if you live through it, you have know, the, 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 uh, the wound, uh, so to speak, you know, you know, you know would, would be only present. But I think this, this map of the world memorial is just devastating, right? What are we talking about? Except the same thing. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think look, I think the the fact that we have a show on a on a social on a body of work by socialist architects that was coordinated uh, in large part uh, across the state or within each state of Yugoslavia is amazing. I think it is very important to think about that right now. What does it mean? And so in that sense, I am absolutely aligned with the with the kind of hope that I think the curators hold. Out, that we can learn from this difference, and that uh, and that it is it is uh, crucial that we do it as soon as possible, right? Uh, but I also think that uh, there are certain dimensions of that uh, history that are flattened and that are that are relevant, uh, relevant precisely to support the desire to learn from this further, and they are in part. I think flattening through certain territorial choices. So for me, the key one is the one about 
uh, authorship, and we have it, it has come up a little bit. And you said the best place to deal with authorship in this show is in the book, or the kind of sociology of authorship is in the book. I happen to think that basically, if you look at the show right now, anyone from a context that isn't second world context is going to walk away thinking, here are these great architects who, in their own bureau somewhere, are inventing projects that um, that allegorize uh, self-management and the collective. They are not going to understand the, the uh, kind of complexity of the enterprises, self-managed enterprises of architects who worked on it. They have only received the name of the architect that is understood to be somehow the ideator of the project. There is no sense of the kind of machine, architectural machine, that stands behind the production of a socialist country in this way. So for me, that is a really important uh, dimension that isn't there, right? I mean, the other thing I would say is that we don't understand the machine that's behind our own production. I mean, the way in which, you know, you think one person produces the building, well, it, it always takes a multiple number of people to produce the building, so we don't recognize that either. I, that undisputed, but in this case, the, we have a kind of a collective machine that is producing for a collective. Well, once, once again, though, you know, I, I think, of course, it could have produced some, you know, visuals, some diagrams, and we could have tried to explain that. It would probably have been a failure, but like most diagrams in architecture shows are usually completely incomprehensible and illegible. Nobody would have been interested, and or we could have, um, you know, um, filled our uh, our walls with lengthy texts explaining. And I think that's precisely what modern architectural exhibition should be doing, and that's precisely why I think it's equally important to understand the project as having two halves. One of which is a book in which this is addressed and at full scale with people who can speak competently to it. So if you're interested in this particular question, you will find the answers in the book. We have some other questions from the audience, but I, just to come back into this. The, one reason to think about what's unsettling about the images and what, how they represent some form of insecurity is not to allegorize, but to represent what the project tries to do. It, it, in its attempt at revision, it tries to unsettle. In turning to socialist architecture of the Yugoslavia for this period, it tries to unsettle coded history, it tries to unsettle moment, tries to unsettle the way we think about architecture at this moment in time. So I think all of these questions are also offer it, offered understanding that, understanding the ambition of the show and understanding its poems. The, but the harder question for everyone, which is why I, I fully, like, I think all of these questions is recognize the impossible challenge of doing a show like this at MoMA now. It's like how to bring that into the structure, the form, the management of, the, the perceptual management of the documents within that space, such that, that the insecurity, the unsettling ambition of the project can come to the foreground. And, and you've already pointed out that it's, it's almost impossible because everything has to be double coded at MoMA. It has to both perform that way and it has to form, perform in a populist way. And so every gesture toward making that reading more acute simultaneously has to step back from it. And so there's, there's a very curious, I mean, I think every exhibition has this problem to some degree, but, but this is what I was also getting at the moment. I think it's a very particular problem, which is why it's almost unimaginable how one deals with that in this context, which is why we are happy to hear you talk about this. Um, but that's not really a question. It's just to come back to this problem of revision. But, okay. okay. I think that's actually a very interesting point yeah. uh, you're making. I actually see, see it a little differently. Yeah. Um, of course, you could say that um, having you know sort of the need to address a larger audience um, leads to a certain dumbing down or flattening out. You could also, no, well, I mean, that's basically what you're pointing at. But it's a, a problem that makes um, a, an architecture exhibition at home somewhat problematic. I think, actually, you could also see it actually completely differently in that exactly, precisely because you know that a large audience and not just a professional audience is going to see the show, you have the responsibility and the opportunity 
to tell the large, the world at large, something very fundamental about architecture. And I think that is exactly what this exhibition is trying to do. And honestly, I think it's actually doing it quite successfully, at least from the many reviews that I've read, in that people actually get the fact that this is a political position in a world that I feel I am losing. I'm not quite sure if I'm actually really living in the right place and at the right time. And so maybe it's nostalgia, but actually I think it's important to remind people there are other ways of thinking about society and how architecture should interact with society. This is one historical composition, it may not be the best one, but I think it's an interesting one to consider for us. I mean, I love that part. So for me, I am totally with you. Uh, for me, the question that I heard Mark pose is partly, uh, and maybe I'll paraphrase it, how can, so right now what, we're, what we have happening is that this material is coming to MoMA and challenging its audiences to think otherwise or to think alternatives. Uh, what we could also have, or maybe the question is, how does this body of work challenge MoMA when it's presenting it? Right? Because maybe some of the the ways in which MoMA has uh, been used to thinking about authorship, objects, uh, images, could be challenged by this body of work. That's interesting. I could like, make it a little bit right. an like, example. You, or? So for me, uh, when you were, you were presenting the kind of uh, uh, drawings and talking about original models, for example, there's a, kind of, there's a love of the original object. Right. Maybe this body of work challenges that law in some way. So MoMA changes its way and understanding of what it is showing to the audience. Or, for example, if we think of the exhibit as it is right now, you squint and you look at the pictures of the Frank Lloyd Wright exhibit in the same space, they are not fundamentally different. And yet, the way in which this work is produced is fundamentally different in those two bodies. There are many things that are fundamentally different about the archival material in those two exhibitions. But as an exhibition, how it occupies space, how it communicates to its audiences, I think this work has the capacity to retrain us and the institution to, to, to talk about architecture in all of the fundamental ways in which you're interested in bringing. Um, okay, first of all, thank you for uh, everybody. Um, uh, I do think, actually, uh, and to Anna's comment, actually, uh, I'm also a specimen from Yugoslavia, so you can take me like that in a slightly schizophrenic role, you know, writing about it, and writing books about it, and also living it, you know, as a, as a child, and a student. Um, I really do not do nostalgia. At that show. Uh, I would rather refer to, and that's personal, uh, the subject is not really shown in the show because it's experience. It's rather documents, yeah? it's a rather documentary exhibition, which is quite liberating for me because as an anecdote, <coughs> um, I do have questions though. Uh, I took my son this summer. He wanted to see Daddy's childhood, who was in America. And uh, he looked at the camera, he made about 200 photographs systematically. And I had this, and uh, it is his favorite piece, which is the television. And, uh, but I was thinking, this is so interesting because it may be a prolonged nostalgia for him, who never lived it. I think that's something to think about. And the same thing that I'm writing about right now, for the future period, uh, on the show, uh, one of the years of the um, it's on the focus of documentation and documentary, which we spoke about. I'm really curious because from what I know, uh, only the projects that have documents have been presented in a true historian fashion, if not traditional, it's a radical tradition which I really respect and I like. And at first it was really, I saw this as uneasy because I know so many architects actually call me, why is my building not in the show and blah blah blah? Do you have drawings? I don't. So, um, there's something quite fascinating about that. If we look at this continuing architecture from one system into the, as you write, global architectural modern history, 
So if we treat them as an immigrants, the, diff the line is not between documented immigrants and undocumented immigrants, which may be far more. And for that, that's a question for you. How do you manage to go to this challenge to keep that so strict? Because I know there were questions that matters in the documentaries and the process. And also, second, I must say, everybody, I'm really exhilarated for the opportunity to open up scholarship for the undocumented. Because there are methods today to you know, treat buildings as documented on this time. So I'm curious about your take. Yeah, that's uh, actually uh, obviously a very inter interesting methodological predicament. And um, it was just basically um, a rule that we applied to ourselves. Uh, First of all, it was a bit rather dogmatic. It said nothing except originals. And um, I think fundamentally in a situation where you're dealing uh, with only work that is not at all secured, where, of course, there are um, some institutions in the, in the, in the region um, that have collected for many years, thank God, and there were a lot of collectors. A lot of the material actually comes from highly insecure backgrounds where you really had to find an exile for these, uh, you know, potential immigrants. Maybe they become exiled again, but um, at least for a temporary period to secure that they could even survive the immediate future. Um, and, you know, in that sense, the show, to some degree, also, it was also intended as a rescue operation, not only with regard to the imminent threat that many of these buildings are facing, not just in Yugoslavia, it's something that affects post war architecture globally. Uh, 60s and 70s architecture, much of which was developed in this um, welfare state ethos, it's just uh, yeah, highly contested intellectually, but also as, as, as a body of work, but also the representations of things in archives and private, in private collections and so on and so on and so forth. So by putting so much stress on the original, uh, it was also you know, trying to indicate that there is a problem there and we better you know, pay attention to these things before they're all gone. Thank you, Martina. Thank you, Anna. We have to wrap up now and thank you all for coming.